Let's grab our Bibles. We're going to turn to the book of 1 Corinthians, and we're in chapter 2 now. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to read verses 1 to 5 this morning. And as we do that, why don't we go ahead and stand together as the body of Christ, recognizing that God's Word is infallible, that it is inerrant, that it is the authority over our lives. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. Paul says, And I... When I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and much trembling. And my speech and my wisdom were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and power so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Let's pray. Father, we desire that our faith would rest on a solid foundation. We do not want superficiality. We do not want that which is shallow and weak. Lord, we want our faith to be built on the rock, and that rock is Christ Jesus. So, Father, I I pray that even as we work through this passage now, that you would help me to have what Paul had, that demonstration of the Spirit's power, not in the man, not in the man's cleverness or his apparent wisdom, but in the wisdom that comes from the Spirit of God. And we pray in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. If you had a Friday night to do whatever you wanted to do, it's free on the calendar. I know that almost never comes up for some of us. Our lives are so busy. But if you had a free Friday night to do whatever you wanted to do, what would you do? What would you do? For some of you, uh, you would want to stay inside. You would... I want to get into your most comfortable lazy boy recliner. You'd want to get that remote control which fits so perfectly in the palm of your hands and you would just like to spend the evening at home. Does that sound good to some of you? Probably does. Others of you, maybe you want to text your friend, you want to go out, you're going to meet at the Applebee's, you're going to have dinner together, you want to go out dancing, you want to have fun. Uh, For others of you, sports is what it's all about. You would want to be at the high school football game on a Friday night, checking the college scores on your phone, altering your NFL uh, fantasy team with your buddies. It is all about sports. You love sports. Uh, That's what you live and die for. And if you had a free Friday night, well, by all means, you would do sports. Um, Some of you, maybe you'd want something kind of highbrow, some sort of cultural thing. Maybe you'd want to go to an art show or a wine tasting or something like that, some kind of culturally sophisticated event. And others of you, maybe exactly the opposite, maybe you'd want to go mudbogging. Have you ever heard of mudbogging before? Raise your hand if you've heard of mudbogging. I'd never heard of that before I moved down to the south. I thought it was like toboggan the first time I heard that. Toboggan, you know, in the north we go down the hill on a sled. I assumed that a mud boggin was like a toboggan on a sled with no snow. So it's mud boggin. It makes sense, doesn't it? That's what I thought it was. And then, of course, there are some of us that honestly, if we had a free Friday night, we would just want to go to bed early. Does that sound good to you? Who here would go to bed early if you had a free Friday night? Exactly. I might be tempted to take that one myself. Uh, If you were to ask a Corinthian in the uh, book of the New Testament what they would want to do on a free Friday night, there were two things that the Corinthians were absolutely passionate about. They would love to spend their time this way. First of all, they would agree with you if you said sports. The Corinthians were great lovers of sports. In fact, you've probably already heard of the Olympic Games. I imagine everybody's heard of the Olympic Games. But have you heard of the Isthmian Games? The Isthmian Games, they were held in the city of Corinth on alternating years before and after the Olympics. And they loved 
the Isthmian Games. In fact, they would have a horse racing, chariot racing. These were the two big events. And then they would have something that's kind of like today's ultimate fighting or mixed martial arts. There was a sport called pancration where men uh, would beat each other up with their fists. It was like boxing and wrestling and kickboxing all combined. Uh, They loved to watch that. They had wrestling matches as well. And then uh, those were all for the men, by the way. And the women were allowed to compete in uh, musical uh, recitals, singing or poetry recitals, and everybody would gather together for the Isthmian Games. They absolutely loved it. But what would you do if it was not the year of the Isthmian Games? What else was there to do in Corinth? And here's where it might surprise you. The Corinthians loved public speaking. Isn't that exciting? The Corinthians had a free night. They would love to go out and hear somebody give a speech or a message of some type. In fact, they would hear almost any topic. They would gather together down in the, uh, in the amphitheater and somebody would give a speech, whether it was on philosophy or whether it was on astronomy or whether it was on politics or whether it was on science or art or any kind of a concept going on, current events, whatever, and they would love to gather together and to hear the speeches. And I guess, you know, for most of us, if we're completely honest, that's probably not something we would want to do with our free time. But what else would you do in the days before technology, in the days before the internet, in the days before Amazon Prime and Netflix on our television? Well, you'd go hear a speech down at the amphitheater. In fact, The Corinthians were known to have celebrated oratory, a rhetoric so highly that they prized being able to speak publicly as much as we would honor today a degree from a university. And so if you were a Corinthian, your highest aspiration for your children, think about this, your highest aspiration for your kids is that they would be able to learn how to give a talk, that they would be able to give a speech and to do the arts They called it of rhetoric. And everybody knew that there was one textbook by which they would grade these public speakers and they would evaluate them and they would weigh them out just like today we would uh, have uh, our competitions on TV, our singing contests and our talent contests, all that kind of stuff, American Idol, whatever. They would grade their speakers by Aristotle's textbook which was called The Art of of rhetoric, that was the standard text, and everybody who came to speak would be graded on this particular standard. And so when Paul, the apostle, came to the city of Corinth, and he began to preach, what do you think they did? Well, of course, they gathered together, and they heard the apostle Paul, and they graded him just as they would grade any other public speaker, entertainer, in their day. And we know what they thought of the Apostle Paul, and it wasn't very flattering. We know it because in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 10, Paul says this. He's quoting them. They say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily his bodily presence is weak, and his speech is of no account. In other words, they were not impressed with Paul's speaking. And so in our text today, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. We're going to address what Paul has to say in reply. They don't think he's very good. He knows that. And what he says is simply this. I did not come to entertain you, Corinthians. I did not come to be your Friday night out on the town. I did not come to win an audience with my ability to give a public oration or speech. In other words, don't grade me as you grade the other entertainers. And I wanna just suggest this at the very beginning of the message today. Probably there is no era in the history of Christianity that this particular paragraph is more relevant than today. You know why? Because churches all over the United States are caving to the pressures to entertain an audience. Why are we doing that? I'll tell you why, because uh, there were times in history in Europe, for instance, where it was compulsory to attend church. 
And they made them attend church. The church was part of the city state. And so people were forced. All citizens were supposed to attend church by law. And so they didn't necessarily have any pressure to gain an audience or to fill up a, a sanctuary. Even earlier in America, in our own country, there was a time, there was a place, there was a cultural ethos where everybody came to church. Of course you came to worship. The colonialists, the Puritans, of course they would worship God. But is it the same today? No, it's not. Why not? Because we have so many competing forces for our time, for our entertainment, for our money, for our resources, especially for our free hours. We've got Amazon Prime, we've got Netflix, we've got the NFL Network, we've got 200 cable channels. Raise your hand if you have over 200 cable channels on your package today, don't be shy. And so churches all over America, they're struggling to compete. They're struggling to fill the pews. And so what are churches doing? I'll tell you what they're doing. They're tempted to trade out the gospel preaching of the Bible for a different methodology that seeks to win the audience by entertainment. And what I'd like to do today is simply talk about that. And so uh, my outline today is going to be very simple. We're just going to go through this paragraph all five verses, I'm going to say a little bit of something about each verse, all five points, and then I'm going to have two questions for you at the end of the sermon, okay? So five verses, two questions at the end. Let's begin with verse one. First of all, Paul says this, and I, when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Do you know that the church can never compete with the entertainment of the world because we were not meant to do so. The church will never be able to entertain you as good as the world can entertain you. And Paul knew that, all right? He admits as much. He says, I didn't come for that reason. I didn't come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Now, if here he's talking about the wisdom of man. He's talking about being clever. Okay? Of course Paul is wise, we know that. Paul's one of the wisest men of the New Testament. He had wisdom. Paul isn't saying we shouldn't be wise. Of course we should be wise. The Bible everywhere proclaims that wisdom is a good thing. Have you read the book of Proverbs? It talks about wisdom a lot. In fact, personally, I have no doubt. I have no doubt that if Paul wanted to compete with the Corinthian orators, the public speakers, the entertainers of his day, then he certainly had the capability to do so, okay? But Paul doesn't do it. He's not interested in being considered an entertainer because he has completely different goals. He has a different purpose in mind. What, after all, is the purpose of gospel preaching? What is it? Is it to gather a crowd, yes or no? No, it's not. We may be tempted to do that at times, but the goal of Bible preaching is not that you would win the favor of the audience. And by the way, a good speaker in Corinth was considered one who could woo the audience to his own acclaim. A Corinthian speaker could turn his popularity into a pretty good financial asset. People would come to a good speaker and teach, they would want their children to be trained by a good orator, and so the better you could woo the crowd, the better you could hold their gaze, the better you could gain their favor, the more you could turn that, you could spin it into a business where you would teach your speaking abilities. And Paul says, I'm not interested in that. Well, what is the goal then of Christian preaching? The goal of Christian preaching is not to gain an audience. The goal of Christian preaching is first and foremost to be faithful to God. Somebody say amen. The goal is to be faithful to God. The goal is to be a true and clear proclaimer of what God has first of all revealed to the man. That's why when we look at the Old Testament, the prophets did not gain audiences. The prophets were not considered popular. The prophets were not considered entertainers. The prophets had to deal with concepts like sin and get this, repentance. And the apostles of the New Testament, they had to preach things like atonement and the blood of Christ and the cost of his death and resurrection for us. And so Paul says, look, if that's the game, I'm not playing, I'm out. Not here to do that, 
It's not what God called me to do. Now the world, of course, completely the opposite. With the world, uh, the formula goes simply like this, all right? The, the four Fs. You get fans, you get a following, you gain fame, and you turn it into finances. The four Fs. Fans, following, fame, finances. And by the way, the world is very good at doing that exact thing. You want to talk about Disney, you want to talk about Marvel, you want to talk about the NFL, you want to talk about New Line Cinema, you want to talk about HBO. They are masters of gaining your affection. They want you wearing their t-shirt. Don't you know that? Isn't it crazy that we'll go out and we'll spend $25 on a t-shirt with a Nike logo so that we can go out and be their billboard, billboard and advertise for them? That's what you're doing. I, I got a text message a couple of weeks ago from a friend. She knew I'd appreciate this. In fact, I think I have the picture of the 3D glasses up there. Can we put that up there? There it is. I don't know if you can see that. Uh, it's, it, that's actually a program for a worship concert that somebody went to and they texted it and then they sent it over to me. And, and the, here, it was a Christian concert and uh, probably a bunch of Christian bands that you would know, you would recognize some of, these, some of these singers. And when you went to the concert, they handed you this pair of 3D glasses, just like when you go to the movie theater and you wear the 3D glasses and it enhances your visual observation of, of that event. But this wasn't playing at the IMAX theater, all right? This was a Christian worship concert. And I can just imagine that a lot of people went to that concert and when they handed them their program and their 3D glasses, probably a lot of people said, this is gonna be good, right? Wouldn't you? I can't wait to see what this is gonna be like with 3D glasses. How much better is this concert gonna be when I put these on and I can see the lights and the lasers and the smoke machines? This is going to be amazing. But the problem with that, the problem with that is that there's a very subtle hint and nuance that somehow the gospel isn't enough. We've got to do something more. We've got to do something better. We've got to make this show bigger. And Paul says, I'm not playing that game. Um, Here's an opinion. You can take it or leave it, doesn't matter to me. Ever watch a Christian movie before? And you watch the Christian movie and there's just a little sense that it's cheesy. (laughs) You smell a little Velveeta somewhere. And it's like, no matter how tr- you know, good we try to make our Christian movies to make them equal to the secular movies, there's, I don't know if you sense this, but I always sense it. Whenever I watch a Christian movie, there's always just a little bit of a cringe factor for me. Can I get an amen? Do you hear? Do you, do you, do you, right? Why? 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 Because the church was never meant to compete with the world and the game of entertainment. We'll never win. We'll just, we're just not going to win that one, okay? So, that's verse 1. Let's go on to verse 2. What does he say? For I decided, okay, you're not playing that game. Well, what game are you playing, Paul? What is your goal? I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. So, Paul says, look, Christ is going to be the center of everything I say. Christ is going to be the center of everything I do. Christ is going to be uplifted. Christ is going to be made magnificent. Christ is going to be held out as glorious and wonderful. And when I preach to you, Paul says, I'm not coming here to woo your affection for me. What I'm doing is I'm actually lifting up somebody else, and that person is Christ, such that I want his power to be revealed, I want his glory to be displayed, I want his love to be made known, I want his holiness to be glorified. And Paul says it is not about the cleverness, it is not about the charisma of the preacher, it is about Christ, it always has been, it always will be Christ, the center of our affection. Now somebody might look at this verse and they might say, 
Okay, wait, so Paul never preached on anything else except for the crucifixion? Is that it? That's the only thing he ever preached? I would say um, primarily. He probably preached on other topics. He probably talked about prayer. He probably talked about fasting. He probably talked about Moses and the Exodus. He probably talked about the Ten Commandments and the law. I'm not saying that Paul only preached on the cross, like John 19 or Matthew 27 are the only passages he ever preached. What I am saying, however, is that everything Paul said and did was always working towards the cross. You see that? It's always working towards the cross, always uplifting Christ and the gospel so that at the very end of the day, what's super duper abundantly clear is that the gospel is what's on display, not the cleverness or the creativity of the man himself, the preacher or the church. Now, I'm going to uh, step out on a branch here and hope I don't saw myself off, but I'm just gonna wager another opinion. I heard recently, uh, last year, there was a mega church in New Jersey, and the name of the church was Liquid Church. Now, already I'm thinking, okay, this is, they're trying to be cool. Liquid Church. And for Christmas last year, they themed the entire worship structure all during the season of Advent on the new movie that was coming out last year. Do you remember this? Star Wars, remember the new Star Wars movie came out? And so they shaped the entire worship service for the entire month of December around the movie of Star Wars, and it was, was pretty cool, I would imagine. Uh, they had a manger scene, a nativity scene out front, outside in the narthex, where you could take a picture with their staff members, and they had somebody was dressed up like Chewbacca, and somebody else was dressed up like Princess Leia, and somebody else was dressed up as, get this, Darth Santa. Pretty cool, right? And the pastor himself, he came out, decked out fully in a Han Solo costume. If you're not familiar with Han Solo, he's the cool guy in the Star Wars uh, series. He is the cool guy who wears the leather jacket and he's kind of avant-garde and he's, he's kind of a hipster before there was such a thing as a hipster. So of course, the pastor would have to be Han Solo, okay? And for Christmas Eve, Liquid Church, they got 9,000 people to come to their worship service that night. 9,000. Now let's, let's just be objective here for a moment and think about this. On the positive, to their credit, 9,000 people ain't bad. Most we've ever done here at Faith Church on Easter Sunday, including our sunrise service main service, baptism service, and Providence, our church plan at the time, was about 800 people. So we've never even cracked, like we've never even cracked a thousand on our best day. So first thing we can say here is, well done and good job. You, you got an audience, okay? You, you got an audience, that is good. That is good, and I don't mean to diminish that because that is a hard thing to do. But here's my question. If you, let's say you interviewed somebody that was coming out of that worship service at the end of the night, Christmas Eve, and you said, what was the service about tonight? What do you think people would say? Star Wars. So here's, here's the danger. Like, if anything rivals the supremacy and the centrality of Christ, it's a problem even if that thing is effective in bringing people to the table, so to speak, okay? So, so really, we've got two problems here. The first problem is a theological problem, and that is that we might actually, if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we might actually step into the area of apostasy or blasphemy by putting something else equal to the Lord Jesus Christ. We can't do, we cannot do that, no matter how good of a crowd or an audience that gains us. We can't go there. Okay? But then there's a, there's a practical problem as well. There's a secondary problem, and that is simply this. It's what the entertainment industry calls jumping the shark. Do you know what jumping the shark is? 
It goes back to the show Happy Days, where Happy Days was kind of losing its audience. And so at the end of the season one year, they had Fonzie. Remember Fonzie, the cool guy in the show? Fonzie actually does this bit where he's on water skis and he literally jumps over a shark. You can watch it on YouTube. It was like their greatest moment. But, but here's the problem with that. Once Fonzie jumps the shark, then what? Then what? What do you do now? And so I can imagine that Liquid Church now has to deal with this, well, what are we going to do this year? Well, what are they going to do this year? They're going to have to go bigger. They're going to have to go better. They're going to have to go more lights, more costumes, more video clips. And by the way, how could you ever then go back to a series like, well, now we're going to preach through Galatians? How is that going to work? So you've got the jumping the shark problem. So that's Number two, Christ has to be the center. Let's go on to verse three. Paul says, look at this. You have your Bible open? You with me? Okay. I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. So Paul says, you know, part of the problem for me why I can't be like your Corinthian entertainer orator rhetoricians, part of the problem for me is when I'm actually preaching, I'm terrified. Like, Paul says, I'm up here. How, how can I concentrate on my eloquence? How can I concentrate on my erudition? How can I concentrate on my physical posture and my presentation? Don't you know I'm terrified up here? Like I'm trembling when I'm preaching the gospel. Paul says, I can't concentrate on you. It's enough for me to speak and not fall all over myself. And we might say, well, Paul, why are you so nervous? You're preaching the gospel all over the Roman world. Like we have the book of Acts. We know you preach in this city, in this city, in this city. You ought to be good at this by now, Apostle Paul. But here's the problem. Paul knows, he knows that when the preacher stands up to preach the word of God, listen, Heaven and hell are literally on the line that Sunday morning. Like people might be saved by what is said or people might be damned by their rejection of the gospel. Heaven and hell are literally on the line. And more than that, did you know that those of us who preach the gospel, we literally put our souls in danger because the Bible says that those who teach and preach will be judged more harshly than those who don't. Paul says, how am I going to concentrate on entertaining you and winning your affection when I'm just trying to be faithful? And so, listen, this is why I personally, my, my stomach is in knots every Sunday when I, when I preach the word of God. If, if anybody comes up here on this platform, like whether, whether they're preaching or whether they're singing or whether they're praying or giving announcements, and, and you don't have the sense of the divine presence of God, like if you come up here, and you're flippant and you're thoughtless and you're careless and you're irreverence, man, your soul is in danger. Don't you see that? Like, this is weighty stuff. This is weighty. This is heavy. That's why, like, when I see a preacher with, an, like, a Hawaiian shirt or if I come into a, a worship sanctuary and it, lo- it literally looks like a shopping mall to me, I'm saying, where's the fear? Where's, where's the temerity? Where's the awe? Where's the reverence? Now, don't get me wrong here because I, f- I have a feeling I, 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 I might be on the verge of miscommunicating. I don't want you to think that Christianity is only about doom and gloom and fear and judgment. Okay, There, there is that, and I'm not going to deny it. It's on every, every chapter of the Bible. There is, there is fear and holy awe that comes upon us. But there are also some other themes, okay? In Christianity, we've got love, we've got joy, we've got the comfort of Christ, we've got the idea of his healing and, and reconciliation between God and man. So there's all these other beautiful themes too, as well as just the fear and, and, and the awe kind of stuff. There's, there's the love and there's the grace and the mercy, okay? But, but what I'm saying is simply this. There ought to be a sense that what we do here is different from what takes place outside of the walls of the church, right? There, there's a loftiness. There, there's, there's a height. There's a grandeur. There's a majesty to the things of Christ that, that the world doesn't have. And so they're, they're good at the 
they're good at the, uh, the, the t-shirt thing and, and the movie thing, but, but we've got something different. We've got the exalted, lofty grandeur of Christ. And what I'm, I'm afraid, I'm just afraid that that's not present in very many churches today. And you could walk into a lot of churches that are going with the entertainment model and you'd say, where's the awe? Where's the fear? Where's the reverence for the presence of Christ? Okay, all right, let's go on to verse four. We're gonna have to wrap up here in a timely manner. Verse four, the real power is found here. Look at verse four. Paul says, my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration, underline that word, of the spirit and of power. Okay, now here's where I know that Paul could have been a good orator if he wanted to, because he knows how to do it. The word demonstration there, I asked you to underline that word in your Bible. The word demonstration actually goes back to Aristotle's textbook, The Art of Rhetoric. Remember I said that all the Corinthians would, would grade themselves based on Aristotle's book, The Art of Rhetoric, which was the masterpiece of how to speak well. And Aristotle has this concept called the demonstration. And that consists of a logical, airtight proof in the form of a syllogism wherein you are convincing your audience both rationally with the mind and emotively with the heart that what you're saying is persuasive. It was called the demonstration. And the good orators, the Corinthians, would be listening for the demonstration that would prove their point, that would rationally convince the audience to join the speaker in agreeing with his main purpose or point. Paul actually uses that term from Aristotle. He says, but what is my demonstration? What, what, where's the proof in my pudding, so to speak? He says, it's here. It's in the spirit and in power. You see, when the apostles preached the gospel, and we see this all the way through the book of Acts, when the apostles preached the gospel, they were not left alone up there preaching for the audience, but the Spirit of God mightily attended the proclamation of the word so that the Spirit was actually doing something in the midst of the hearers, okay? Sometimes hardening their hearts, sometimes melting their hearts, to receive the word of God. And so the signs of wonders and awe attend the preaching of the apostles such that in the book of Acts, when we see the apostles preaching, sometimes people get saved, right? Sometimes people begin to speak in tongues in the book of Acts. Sometimes people get healed in the book of Acts. And sometimes people get angry and start throwing stones and rocks at the preacher. But the spirit of God is always doing his work. And so Paul says, I don't need all of the flowery eloquence of the rhetoricians. I have something more powerful. I am working through, I'm being used by, would probably be a better way to say it, a power that is greater than myself. And that power is the Spirit of God working in the midst as the Word of God is faithfully preached and proclaimed. Okay? Final point, I'm going to hit this real short and then I've got two questions for you. Five, verse five, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. You say, what's the so what of this passage? The so what is the so that in verse five, okay? The so what is the so that. What's the so that? The so that is that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Listen, no matter how good the speaker, no matter how entertaining the service, no matter how winsome the presentation, the orator himself will never love you like you need to be loved by Christ alone. I love you. It's true. But I can't love you in the ways and to the degree that Christ can love you. So all things considered, I would rather have him love you than for me to win your favor and appeal. Does that make sense? The speaker, no matter how winsome and capable and clever his presentation, he cannot save you. The preacher cannot die for you. 
Christ has died for you. And so your faith should be in him and not the cleverness or the ability of the man, okay? Now, I just have two questions and then I'm, I'm through and we're gonna dismiss a little bit early today so we can go on to the congregational meeting, which is very important in the life of the church, okay? But two application questions first. Number one, do you need to be entertained relentlessly? Now, don't answer that too quickly. I want you to think about it. Is your mind of the type that must constantly be entertained? Can you get through dinner without checking your phone? Can you? Can you listen to what your children tell you when they come home from school without having to click over and look at your Facebook feed? Are you able to do that? Okay. Can you read a book for 20 minutes or 30 minutes without having to flip back over to your social media? Can you do that? Can you study your homework, college students, without having to listen to the radio and the background? Are you the type of person that constantly needs to be entertained? Do you ever have an evening alone quietly without the television blasting at full volume behind you? Are you the kind of mind that needs to be entertained always, all the time, 24 hours a day? If you are, you're probably going to be the kind of person that thinks getting your picture taken with Chewbacca at the manger scene is pretty cool. Because you will be susceptible to entertainment, superficial and shallow forms of ministry. Second question, has your heart, on the contrary, been trained to be satisfied by the gospel of Christ instead? Do you need a lot of panache? Do you need a lot of style? Do you need a lot of pizzazz for your heart to be filled with the word of God, to be satisfied in Christ? Could we do this together if we were in a cave Could we do this together if we didn't have air conditioning? Could we do this together if we didn't have a PowerPoint behind me? Could you hear a man pick up the Bible and simply preach Christ? And even if he is of lesser skill and ability, that you would say to yourself, yes, give me Christ. I want him, my heart will be filled with him and him alone. If that is true for you, then you truly have apprehended the wisdom of the word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for today's worship service. Lord, we thank you for the final hymn which we are now going to sing together as the body of Christ. Lord, we pray for our meeting which will take place in just a few moments from now. I pray that that goes well. But before we do any of those things, Father, would you please work your spirit in hearts today, convicting convincing, converting. Draw people to Jesus, Lord. Show people the majesty of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's stand for the benediction. Just a couple words of uh, exhortation before we close here with our final hymn. First of all, we're gonna take a 10 minute break between the end of the service and the beginning of the congregational meeting. So if you need to go out and uh, take some refreshment, please go ahead and do that. Uh, And then uh, those of you who have children, you should please go get your children because the nursery workers are probably pulling their hair out by now. So go get your kids, bring them back into the meeting with you, that's fine, there's no problem with that. You do need to pick up uh, your children. Uh, We'll begin the meeting in about 10 minutes. Uh, It is for members. If you're a member of the church, you have voice and vote in today's meeting. If you're not a member, you are free to come and observe, but you may not uh, voice your opinion or you may not vote in the proceedings, okay? So there's that. And finally, let me just say that the elders will be right here. The deacons will be right here. And they would love to talk to you about anything that's on your heart. Elders would love to pray with you. 
uh, pray for healing, pray to receive Christ. The deacons will be available to talk to you about financial needs or anything else you've got going on in your life, okay? Let's receive the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and all God's people said, amen. Amen. Love you lots. Have a great week.